My name is Jakob Endresta Kjellan. I'm a developer at Variant in Trondheim, and that's everything you're going to get to know about me because we're in kind of a hurry. Today, I have two goals. The first one is to teach you something that might be useful in a hobby project or at work. And the second one, which is honestly way more important, is that you'll get a little bit excited about CSS. Before we get to the fun part, let's talk about browsers and stuff, because every web developer knows that the enemy of any modern functionality are users who, for the life of them, refuse to update their browsers. But we have, go have a couple of tools that can help us with this. The first one I'm sure most of you have used before, caniuse.com. It's a great website that lets you check uh, a feature in a browser and to see which versions of the browser and what percentage of the global user base supports that feature. So in this case, we can see that uh, Flexbox is supported by 98% of users, for example. Next, we have another very common and useful tool, PostCSS. It's a CSS preprocessor, which means that it runs on your code after you've written it, but before you actually ship it anywhere. And depending on what plugins you give it, it can do a bunch of useful things. Or in other words, this bad boy can fit so much functionality in it. And the functionality that we care about is right there in the front seat, polyfills. So a polyfill will take your sleek, nice, new code and turn it into something equivalent that's old and ugly and smelly, uh, but has the added benefit of actually running on browsers. And so specifically, there's one plugin, uh, which is actually kind of a pack of plugins that's your absolute best friend in the world when trying to use modern CSS. And it's this one, PostCSS Preset ENV. Here, you can basically define the features that you want to support, the browser versions that you want to support, and then this will do a bunch of magic, apply all the polyfills you need, and off you go. So now we're at the fun part. For each feature, I've included the caniuse.com percentage, as well as a checkbox if, the, if there is a post-CSS polyfill available. So let's start with the has selector. This one has gotten pretty mainstream by now, I think, but it's so cool and incredibly useful that I want to show it off anyway. So what it basically lets you do is check if something contains something else. So if I want to style, style my container, uh, if it has an H1 element inside of it, I can do that with the has selector. We can get a little bit more tricky as well. Let's say that, for example, we want to give our container a styling based on how many elements it has inside of it. So if I want to style my container, if it has three or more elements, I can look for the third child with the has selector. This is super useful. And getting even more fancy, I've made a very minimal form that has an email input, as well as a, a hint that will let the user know that they need to input a valid email. And so that hint is hidden by default. Uh, but then if my form has an invalid email, which is also not in focus, it'll display that hint. And so we can see what that looks like here. And to me, this looks like something that you need JavaScript for, right? But this is just HTML and CSS, which I think is super cool. Moving on, we have cascade layers. Uh, so you know how very often multiple pieces of CSS compete to style the same element, right? And so in this case, we have an ID selector and an element selector that are both trying to apply uh, their styling to this, this element right here. And as I'm sure you know, the ID selector is stronger than the element selector, and so we get a nice medium aquamarine text here. And that uh, is selector specificity, which is right in the middle there. Uh, and it's just one part of the cascade, which is the C in CSS. And the cascade is what lets the browser decide which style should be applied to which elements. And so this actually has way more parts that I've uh, removed for simplicity here. Um, but one of them is called cascade layers, and it fits in right there. So to define a layer, we use the at layer. Uh, we use at layer and then give it a name. So here I've made two layers, the base layer and the specific layer. And so here, the later a layer is defined the first time, the more important it is. So here, my specific layer is always going to be more important than the base layer. So even though the element selector is usually weaker than the ID selector, our text will now be brown. So a pattern that you'll very often see uh, in the wild with, uh, with cascade layers is this sort of pattern where you define, all the, you define the order of the layers in the first line of the file, and then you can refer back to them as many times as you want without changing their importance. Next, we have something that is shockingly useful once you know it exists, and it's really simple. 
aspect ratio lets you define, you guessed it, the aspect ratio of an element. So if you want to make a square, for example, you can give it aspect ratio 1. Or maybe you want to do 16 by 9 because you have a video. This is super useful. Uh, another short and sweet one is accent color. So we're going to do some audience participation now. Who here has made a custom checkbox before? Yeah, great. So you will all know that it takes a completely ridiculous amount of CSS to make a custom checkbox, right? Specifically, it takes this much CSS. And this is a minimal basic example. What if I told you that you could do all of that with one line of CSS now? I'd be lying to you. You can't do that. Um, <laughs> But if you just want to change the color of your input elements, you can with accent color. So if you're, bo uh, if you're bored of the, the standard, safe blue, and you want to get a nice olive drab checkbox instead, that's now possible. And this also works with radio buttons, range sliders, and progress bars. Next, uh, we have nested selectors. So let's say that we want to style a bunch of elements that are all inside a container, for example. So the normal way to do that is that we specify container, element, container, element, and maybe we have a media query and, and all of that, right? Well, you don't have to do that anymore. If you want, you can just nest all of those selectors inside the container selector. You put a little ampersand in front so the browsers are happy, and off you go. So these two are completely equivalent. The next one, I wasn't really sure if I was going to include, because those of you with good eyesight can see that it's at a whopping 0% browser support. <laughs> but that was actually the case for the previous feature just one year ago, and that's almost at 90 now. So because it has a polyfill, so you can technically use it, I figured I'll include it anyway, because it's pretty cool. So let's say that I want to style any paragraph that follows any heading. This is obviously a terrible way to do that, right? It's messy, but it's the, the standard old way to do it. Uh, a better way would be to use the is selector right here, which I'm not technically featuring, but there you go. Uh, it makes it better, but it's still not super reusable, um, not necessarily very readable, and that's where the custom selector comes in. So by doing at custom selector and giving it a name, it uses a weird like colon dash dash in front, that's just how it is. And saying that I want heading to be equivalent to any of the heading elements, we can use it in the same way that we, uh, we used this selector earlier on. And so the nice thing about this is that you get to reuse it other places if you want. And another added bonus is that if you have something that's like sort of a Cthulhu monstrosity, uh, then you can give it a descriptive name. So everyone will understand immediately that this is just a terrible idea. <laughs> Finally, uh, we're at my favorite feature, which I've saved for last, uh, which is container queries. So a very common problem for us is that our layouts vary by available space, right? And you're going to tell me that, Jacob, we have a solution for this already. They're called media queries. And that's true, but only if your layout depends on the viewport size, which is not always the case. So let's say that I have a, a nice app that lists cats here. If I change the viewport, we can see that the list layout is going to change. But if I change my resizable sidebar, we are completely out of luck. And that's where container queries come in. So here, I've defined my cat list, the, the list that holds all the, the results, as a container by using conta the container property, giving it a name, and saying that we want to watch the size. And so then, what I can do is just uh, substitute my media query with a container query, which has almost exactly the same syntax. And that just works. So we can see that if I change the viewport here, the layout changes. But then also, moment of truth, if I change my sidebar, it will change. And honestly, this feels like the sort of thing where once you know that it's possible now, it feels like that's how it should have been the whole time, right? Because we don't really care about the size of the viewport. We care about how much space is available for our elements. And so this just, uh, this is something that just matches how my uh, mental model is anyway, and that's fantastic. It's really nice that we can use this now. So uh, if you're not like this person in the front and to who took uh, meticulous notes throughout the entire talk, I've made a cheat sheet that you can go to my website to see. Uh, if you want to see my slides, there are very many slides. You can also do that there. Thank you very much. <laughs>